The following podcast is an exclusive presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Thank you for coming to the Project Entertainment Network store. Please place your order. A good choice. A t-shirt for the horror show with Brian Keane. A Manta Method coffee mug. There's more. A Necrocast Icon hoodie. That's sharp. But why on earth would you want bizong leggings? Wait, are you Mr. Frank? The Project Entertainment Network store, stacked with goodies from all your favorite podcasts. T-shirts, goodies, mugs and more. www.projectentertainmentnetwork.com There shall come a podcast. A podcast like no other. Defenders Dialogue with Brian Keane and Christopher Golden. Marvel Comics' original superhero non-team convenes once again. The Incredible Hulk, the Savage Submariner, the Master of the Mystic Arts, Doctor Strange, and a dynamic supporting cast of Marvel superheroes battle against evil as the Defenders. Without further ado, true believers, here's your hosts, Brian Keane and Christopher Golden, Excelsior! And welcome back once again, True Believers, to Defenders Dialogue. I'm Brian Keen. And I am Christopher Golden, Brian. And I, I gotta say something to you. Uh, last week, I was unable to participate. And, uh, and I appreciate you jumping in with, uh, w- with your focuses on the particular predilections you have uh, for <laughs> our friend Devil Slayer and... Uh, and I'm always I'm always sad a little bit when I when I miss those conversations. So I'm looking forward to continuing and finishing our work on defenders. But I'm also looking forward to uh, to jumping ahead afterwards to some other weird shit. Uh, so anyway, I agree. And uh, you know, it, it's funny you should you should bring up our old friend Devil Slayer. Uh, yeah, last week's episode, I talked about his very first appearance before he was ever Devil Slayer in Marvel Comics. And next week, you and I will be talking about his last appearance in the pages of the Defenders. Yep. Uh, now, you know, without spoilers, he does not die like Kyle Richmond, a.k.a. Nighthawk. Um, his mortal form is not destroyed like Valkyrie, who we'll get to in a moment here. Right. Uh, I, I think his fate is much more bittersweet than that. But, yeah, next week, his final appearance. Uh, but, but, yes, speaking of Valkyrie. Wow. Uh, Defenders 108 is what we're going to start with today. But before we do that, Chris, um, I know here at the beginning of the show, we, we want to remind folks, you and I uh, both have an event coming up. We do. We do. And I say Excelsior for that event, Brian. Excelsior indeed for that event. <laughs> that event is the Merrimack Valley Halloween Book Festival in Haverhill, Massachusetts at the Haverhill Public Library, October 13th from 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., uh, I'm I'm looking forward to wel- welcoming you back, welcoming Mary back, welcoming uh, Owen King and Kelly Braffitt for the first time, Grady Hendrix for the first time. Uh, my brain is totally fried. I'm very sleepy this morning. Um, Grady, took... have you ever have you been to an event uh, that Grady has attended yet? I have I have shared a panel with Grady and his okay. enthusiasm. I always say Grady is like the horror version of Roberto Benigni winning the Oscar. That's a great example. I was going to say it's like it's like he's a one man circus, and and it just he just he swirls into the room like this tornado. <laughs> it's, just, it's amazing uh, to watch. Yeah, it, his his energy. I think the reason I feel so tired today is having met him. Uh, I believe he's an energy vampire, and he sucks it out of the rest of us. That could be. Could be. Um, I also want to point out to you before we begin this is that it, it, in reference to uh, to this show. Um, I finally unpacked the box of things that I picked up at Boston Comic Con this year, and right. that box included the uh, the Marvel masterworks of the entire run of the Champions, which I got for you, which I will hand you uh, in twelve days or eleven days, and uh, and also uh, volumes two and four of the Essential uh, Marvel two and one. Um, I'll have to pick up volume three, but uh, I have the 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 first volumes worth in uh, in the original comics or in the masterworks. But uh, well, you will you will never guess what I picked up at Baltimore Comic Con this past weekend. What did you pick up? Issues one, 
through 55, plus the first two annuals of Marvel 2 and 1. Well, there you go. See? Great minds think alike, and fools <laughs> seldom differ. You, you know, before we're only doing two issues a day, so before we get to them, we, we have a little extra time. While we're talking about Comic Cons and places we're going to be and stuff, I, I would like to give a quick shout-out, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, to the artist known as Franco. Um, okay. You know, if you uh, are at all familiar with Oh Yeah Comics or uh, Tiny Titans from DC, Lil Hellboy from Dark Horse, um, Patrick the Wolf Boy. Franco is, of, of course, a star with children. Um, my, and a really you know, nice guy. Yeah, great guy. My 10-year-old, Dungeon Master 77.1. Now, you know, he has grown up knowing, you know, you and Rath James White and Wes Oaks and Mary. He's not impressed by any of us. Uh, but he adores Franco. And he and I have been going to Baltimore Comic Con since he was five. He's now 10. And every year he, uh, he wants to stop by Franco's table. And I was just so touched. Yesterday, you know, we, went, we were at the, the convention yesterday. And, of course, uh, at the very end, he says, OK, let's go see Franco. And we go to the table and, and Dungeon Master is looking for, you know, any new volume of Patrick the Wolf Boy or what while we're waiting in line. And while we're in line, Franco looks up from doing a sketch for another another kid, and he sees us, and he greets Dungeon Master. He he remembers Dungeon Master, and it just it left such an impression on my son. He was delighted. It's the happiest I've seen him all year. Oh, that's um, great. You know, and when we get up there, he has a a one on one conversation with Franco and he's telling him how much he loves the new comic encounter and uh he gets him to draw him an original sketch and he gets him to sign one of his graphic novels and he went away having such a, a positive experience. You know, there's there's no doubt in my mind my kid is going to grow up to be some sort of creative. Uh I see it, Mary sees it, uh filmmaker Mike Lombardo sees it, you know, he he's been help teaching him how to direct. He he's already creative. Right. But I think it's going to be people like Franco that really plant that seed, you know, because he's somebody not in the immediate family. Right. Uh, so, yeah, just a shout out to him and a, a shout out to all. Yeah. Comics. And uh, that's all. That's, that's awesome. all I got. Those 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 are the best encounters. Exactly. You know, I mean, it, it's it's huge. Um, and you know what? Uh, I've met Franco. He's a really lovely guy. And um, and the other kids comics creator that I want to I, I just want to mention since you brought that up. If you haven't met him, you probably have actually a phenomenal, phenomenal guy, Andy Runton. You know, I've never met Andy. Oh, Andy, the creator of Owly. And Owly is a uh, it's such a sweet, sweet book for all ages. And I, when yeah. I say all ages, I mean it. I mean, the youngest child, the oldest person can read Owly and, and enjoy it. It's a beautiful work. Um, and Andy is always at these conventions and he's always so kind to... Uh, to, to everyone, to the kids, to the adults. I mean, such a sweet guy. So, so cheers to people like Franco and Andy, um, uh, who are, who are making comics that make kids happy. So, um, exactly. and speaking of happy kids, Brian, uh, he, you and I, uh, at the age that we were reading, uh, Mark DeMattis writing the defenders 108. This was uh, 1982. So we were both teenagers. Yep, exactly. 15. Yep. Um, uh, this was th this particular issue had a plot assist by Mark Grunwald, uh, the breakdowns uh, by Don Perlin, and the finishes by a whole host uh, of Marvel. Uh, you know, Joe Sinnott. Um, let's see here: Hillary Barda, Al Milgram. Um, is it Jack Trapani? I think. I think so. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. So wow. Um, and and so. Done in a rush, but a shitload going on. A lot going on. Uh, very dense issue. And, and in fact, the one after this, 109, is even denser. Uh, but yeah, we begin with a, a full one-page recap of what has gone before. Now, it's been two episodes since we, we covered that. So just to recap for everybody, in the aftermath uh, of our previous saga, Kyle Richmond is dead. He, he was blown up uh, when August Masters blew up the the entire base that they were in and in the aftermath of that valkyrie was shot in the head point blank range 
and supposedly died too. But after her funeral, her ghost appears to the other defenders. And we are then reminded that Valkyrie, the, the, the spirit of Valkyrie, uh, inhabits the body of a mortal woman named Barbara Norris. And Barbara Norris's spirit inhabits the Valkyrie's body in uh, the Asgardian version of Hell, Niflheim or Niflhelm, however you pronounce that. It's Marvel's uh, Freaky Friday. Exactly. Um, and w at the end of, of uh, that episode, before before last week's special episode, uh, Valkyrie's soul got sucked into her sword, Dragonfang, and then the Enchantress appeared and snatched Dragonfang up. And that's where we open, uh, with Namor, Spider-Man, the Beast, the Beast's partner, Vera, Doctor Strange, Son of Satan, Hellcat, Gargoyle, and the Hulk, uh, standing before the Enchantress. Quite, quite a lineup, and unfortunately, Brian, because of the haphazard way in which the art was done in this issue, this uh, splash page doesn't hold a candle to the page that finished the previous issue. It does not. Uh, it is... It, it's a disaster, but that's okay. We'll 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 forgive them for a needing to meet their deadlines. We've been there. It, yeah, it it. <laughs> I mean, I if you look at at Gargoyle's body, uh, contrasted with with Damon Hellstrom's head, Hellstrom's face is bigger than Gargoyle's torso. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, it's it's just not it's just not good. But anyway, so so. So we get to this point where now uh, the Hulk and uh, Namor are confronting uh, the Enchantress. Uh, the Hulk says, Brian, go ahead. Which lady better bring Sword Girl back or Hulk will smash? Yeah, it's always better for you to do the Hulk dialogue. Um, <laughs> so basically, the Enchantress essentially is holding uh, Dragon Fang with Valkyrie's soul in it captive to force them to, do, to uh, perform a task for her, she's blackmailing them into doing them, uh, doing this, and also she causes Valkyrie's spirit trapped in the sword to speak to them from the sword. I don't know; the sword doesn't have a mouth, but apparently, uh, y yet it can scream. Uh, rest in peace, Harlan. Right. Um, we then get a, a panel. I don't want to spend a long time on it, but I want to touch on it. Uh, you know, we, you and I have have just just waxed poetically and enthusiastically about all the character development that Dematis has done during his run on the Defenders. But we get one panel here where Doctor Strange reverts back to being a dick, as he <laughs> did during the Roy Thomas era. You know, Spider-Man is, 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 Spider brings up his adventures with Dragon Fang, which we talked about several episodes back. Uh, right. You know, Marvel team up with him and Valkyrie. And, uh, you know, he, he's he's telling Doctor Strange about this, and Doctor Strange says, having given the blade to Valkyrie Spider-Man, I am well aware of its mystic property. Yeah. <laughs> well, fuck you, dude. <laughs> yeah. Doctor Strange being a passive-aggressive douche. <laughs> oh. But yeah, we then get, you know, Enchantress basically recapping what we just told you about. You know, Barbara Norris's soul is in Valkyrie's body, which is in Asgardian hell. Um, and, you know, she tells the defenders, uh, they have to journey across time and space, uh, to a hellish world where grows the fabled Rose of Purity. And if they get this Rose of Purity and bring it to the Enchantress, the Enchantress, the Valkyrie will live again. And if they say no, she will destroy her body and let her wretched spirit drift off into limbo. Yeah. And then, and then Hellcat gets, you know, rightly pissed off and lunges for the Enchantress and Damon Hellstrom grabs her and manhandles her and, uh, and she's pissed. Damon, what are you doing? Let go of me. Uh, you know, uh, and there's this moment he says, Patsy, as long as the Enchantress has the Valkyrie's body, he's explaining, we must remain calm. And she's basically saying, wow, you're telling me to remain calm. The, the netherworld has changed you. Uh, and he says, not as much as you may think. And he turns and he says to the Enchantress that he, they will do what she, uh, what she demands. Uh, Doctor Strange is not happy with this. Um, he, he wants to know 
and here's the, the linchpin of this story, if they do what she says, and the Valkyrie's soul that's trapped in Dragonfang is put back in her original body, what happens to the soul of Barbara Norris, which now has no body? Well, that soul will eventually dissipate and cease to exist. This is a conundrum for our heroes. It is. It is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, once again, we get some really great character work here by Dematis because the, the defenders are not in agreement about this. Um, you know, Valkyrie herself gets a say. And I love these segments with Valkyrie's dialogue because it's word balloons coming out of the hilt of the sword. Right. <laughs> you know, she says, Valkyrie as a sword, says to, to Hellcat, Patsy, much as I am loath to pass eternity as a bodiless wraith, I cannot inflict a similar torture upon Barbara Norris. So Doctor Strange is saying we can't do this. Valkyrie's saying you can't do this. Hellcat's saying the hell with you both. We're going to do this. And Hulk agrees with Hellcat. Right. Yep. Yeah. So then we basically split the defenders up. You know, they, they, they get to this point where they're, you know, we, we don't need to go through what each character wants to do or not do. No, we'll just give you the teams. Yeah. Uh, the, the team that are going to go to work for the Enchantress are Hellcat, Son of Satan, Hulk, and Namor. Uh, the team that refuse... A lot of, a lot of people with even temperaments. Exactly, yeah. Because, you know, if, if, <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to do things diplomatically, that, that's who you want on your team. Um, the, the team who are refusing to work for the Enchantress are Gargoyle, Beast, Doctor Strange, and Spider-Man. Exactly. So then, basically, they're, they're, it's clear that Doctor Strange and the group you just mentioned have a different plan. Right. Uh, they're they're, up so they go off in, in pursuit of their different plan that we're, that we're not privy to at this point. Uh, the Enchantress uh, goes to meet her beloved. Uh, who is the the reason that she's doing all of this? Right, uh, and we find out that her beloved is the embodiment of love itself. Um, you know, any of our listeners that perhaps grew up reading comics during the Vertigo era, think back to Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Right. Uh, you know, where you had the embodiments of death, dream, despair, etc. Uh, this is sort of Marvel's version, and and yes, Enchantress thinks she is in love. With love itself. There you go. And and in fact, uh, what she's doing, trying to get, trying trying to get this, and this I thought made me a little. I was like, eh. so she's trying to get this flower of purity to regain the purity that once was hers. Right. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I don't like the implications. Well, I, I see what you mean by the implications. I, you know, knowing Mark DeMattis, I don't, I don't think it was that at all. I, uh, Enchantress, just based on her appearances in the Defenders alone, you know, not to mention the, the rest of her history in Marvel, she's, she's not a very nice person. Um, uh, yeah, but but here's my thing. Okay, so and perhaps it isn't about regaining her virginity or what have you, but um, but the idea that in order to become pure again, you have to get this rose of purity that somehow will make you pure again, and to do to do that, you're willing to do whatever horrible thing is necessary. Um, Boy, that sounds like an, uh, uh, a segue into a political rant, but I won't go there. <laughs> well, it's like, let's say, let's pretend, okay? Let's pretend that a new government study said that by the end of this century, uh, carbon, di carbon <laughs> dioxide levels would rise 7%. There you go. Which would put Miami and New York City underwater. And let's say, hypothetically, just pretending... <laughs> that the person in charge said, well, we're screwed anyway, so we might as well just, you know, undo all the restrictions we've already put on. Yeah, we might as well just rush <laughs> as fast sort of as we can to. to our destruction, headlong into our destruction. Uh, and by the way, last week, uh, we were saying that none of that was true. <laughs> <laughs> and still haven't said that even though we've said that this is now true, uh, that we were wrong before, or that <laughs> that there's some strange 
contradiction going on between it being <laughs> totally false and completely true. At the same time, it's like Schrodinger's uh, apocalypse. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> how do we get here? <laughs> the Defenders inspires the strangest <laughs> conversations, Brian. All right. So Hellcat, Son of Satan, Namor, and Hulk uh, with Valkyrie as their unwitting captive because Hellcat is carrying a dragon fang, the sword. They appear on this this desolate, desolate planet. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a nice little bit of dialogue here. Uh, you know, Hellcat's saying, wow, that enchantress sure knows her stuff. I bet she could teach uh, Doctor Strange a thing or two about Hocus Pocus. And Hulk says, why would dumb magician want to learn how to poke us? <laughs> and Submariner responds with, never mind, Behemoth. So, you know, we haven't seen a lot of Namor and Hulk during Dematis's run, other than issue 100. And right away, he's he's got the interplay between these two characters down, yeah. you know? Yeah, and I did I did love that Hulk line too. That's yep. You know, and then we have something really interesting, Brian, is that when Valkyrie inside Dragon Fang is uh, is arguing with them of their plan of action, she sort of drifts away into a, a different place, and somehow they're all privy and witness to almost like uh, Dumbledore has swirled the uh, pool of memories, whatever the hell that thing is called in Harry Potter. Um, and uh, I'm sure that Harry Potter fans are going to yell at me for that. But um, <laughs> if I racked my brain or, or looked in my own pool, I would probably remember that. I don't have a pool. Anyway, um, so they get a, an actual vision. They share a memory of Valkyrie and the Enchantress prior to Valkyrie and Barbara Norris having their whole switcheroo, right. um, their Freaky Friday. And she says, I say the Enchantress sense Lord Odin did disperse the legions of the Valkyrie. Or I have found my life. So basically, Odin broke up the band of the Valkyrie. Right. And Valkyrie's bored. So Enchantress basically says, I, I'm in need of someone with your powers. I can offer you excitement, wonder. Uh, the challenge your life's been missing. Um, and then we, we are interrupted. But it's clear that Valkyrie is now... Uh, having some memories that had been blocked from her. Right. Son of Satan uh, proposes, perhaps now that her soul is freed from the body of Barbara Norris, uh, those blocked memories that have troubled her since her introduction into the Defenders way back in, what was it, issue four? Yeah. Um, you know, that, that maybe those those memories are now starting to return yeah. to her. Um, and, and now, Brian, I want to I wanna just jump ahead a few panels and say... Um, we get what is one of the strangest fucking things that, <laughs> that Tomatis ever wrote. Uh, it, it, it is really, really weird, um, but somehow great at the same time. Oh, I love it. Uh, you know, this is this is Carlton Mellick the Third territory right here. Uh, you know, the the four defenders go trudging across this desolate planet. You know, there's steaming fissures and craters with lava but then they hear a song and uh hulk comments that the the music makes him feel happy but sad at the same time and they come upon des describe what they come upon Chris. well uh they come upon a uh a young beautiful alien woman uh of uncommon beauty dematis tells us and uh she's red and she's playing something that is sort of a harp or a lute, uh, and reminds me of a being out of Star Trek. Uh, and dancing to the tune uh, is an enormous blue, four-eyed, bearded, like clawed, tentacled, you know, scaled, yeah. clawed creature with you know uh, bipedal and humanoid shape except for the two big tentacles sticking out of his abdomen. And behind them is the giant white, like, rose of purity or whatever we're going to call it. Exactly. Um, and it's just and... as weird as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> and Patsy says, very calmly, what do you make of that, guys? 
<laughs> it reminded me of the, the, the Ghostbusters moment when Ackroyd says, no, I'm sorry, Bill Murray says, now there's something you, uh, you don't see every day. <laughs> uh, anyway. So they go, they go rushing forward to, to claim the rose for the Enchantress. At, at that moment, Valkyrie has another, another flashback, another memory. Um, and she's, she's standing on a mountaintop with the Enchantress. And she says, uh, when I first accepted your offer, I knew not of your evil ways, but now I've seen through it and I'll serve you no longer. Uh, and it is at that moment that the Enchantress betrays her and casts her body to hell, uh, frees her spirit, puts it in this crystal. Um, and then, of course, longtime listeners know eventually that that spirit leaves the crystal and inhabits the body of Barbara Norris. Right. Uh, which we which we should point out, by the way, again, this is completely different from the Valkyrie's origin when she's first introduced, uh, or at least it's a uh, it's a reboot. I mean, it it's not the first time the rebooted version. It's been evolving over time. Right. I got to um, tell you, I prefer this version. Oh, this, this version is a lot yeah. easier to explain than uh those early defenders. Yeah, well, it, it makes Valkyrie her own character instead of just something created by, remember, we talked earlier on, the idea that Valkyrie was not a a person. She was a creation of uh, of the Enchantress, purely a, a, you know, a creation, a manifestation of, of some spell the Enchantress cast. And over time, of course, they, they changed it so that she's an actual person. So, in any right. case, we get back to our... Uh, Strange alien couple. Yeah, they um, stop playing music, and the big, giant, bearded hipster monster says, Greetings, strangers. Oh, look, he's articulate and nice. Yeah. Uh, it has been too long since last we welcomed visitors here in the name of our great god. And, and Namer responds about as diplomatically as you can expect the Submariner to respond. <laughs> yeah. God, you say? What god? Why, our beloved god of purity, of course, and the beast uh, motions, to, or I, I should call him a monster, because yes. we don't want to confuse people with Hank McCoy, the beast. The monster motions to the uh, the big, giant white rose. Yeah. And he explains that he and the woman are both survivors of a great ship that crashed on the planet many centuries ago. Uh, the world was always as dead as it, it is now. The only life they found on it was the rose. Uh, the rose itself was the last of its kind, uh, and it nurtured and cared for them, filled them with joy, set free their hearts and their minds. There you go. Now, I, I would like to point out that although there's a, an element of the uh, uh, sort of Russian um, dancing to the visual of the monster doing his special dance that he's doing here, uh, apparently for no reason. All I could think of looking at this panel was uh, was Joss Whedon uh, as Numfar on Angel, Numfar of the Deathwalk Clan. Um, <laughs> if, if you if you watch the series, you may not may or may not know that that this character was Joss Whedon in heavy makeup. Uh, so Numfar do the dance of joy uh, <laughs> is is the thing that this thought of this made me think of. So for Buffy and Angel fans, uh, you know what I'm talking about. There we go. And uh, when the when the defenders surrender to this, the whole world changes. Uh, it becomes a paradise. Uh, you know, there are flowers, there are trees. Submariner is delighted that there are are waters. Remember, he gets his power in his life from the water. Um, it's Eden, there you go. Uh, which makes the son of Satan a little bit uneasy, uh, but he's willing to go along with it. And then there's Hulk and the monster says to Hulk, he puts his big blue hand on the Hulk's big green shoulder. And this is my favorite moment of the book. He says, and what of you, my emerald friend, your face is tight with worry. And, and here we get the crux. The defenders came here to help Valkyrie. And now they're they're here in Eden, and they've momentarily forgotten all about Valkyrie, but not Hulk. Hulk says, world is nice, and maybe Hulk would like to stay here sometime. But Sword Girl is dead, and we must have Rose to bring her back. And the monster says, you want to take our god? No! And Hulk says, yes! 
and flattens him uh, for and a moment. The fight it, breaks out. He doesn't say stay flattened. Yes, uh, he, he the monster starts beating the shit out of the defenders, um, but he's distracted by the male defenders. Uh, Patsy is able to sneak off with Dragon Fang and is attempting to hack down the White Rose of Purity. Um, while Dragon Fang, Dragon Fang argues with her. Yes, while, while Dragon Fang argues with her and seems to be resisting. Uh, and, and then the, the other alien, the Star Trek type alien, uh, inter, intervenes and, you know, they're, they're fighting. The world begins to change around them. Right. And, and as the world is changing, there's also some delightful interplay between Submariner and Hulk. Submariner says, Hulk, you fool, you didn't allow us time to explain why we need the rose. And Hulk <laughs> says, don't yell at Hulk, fish man. Hulk was just trying to help Fred. And that is all you need to know about the Hulk and Submariner's relationship with the defendant. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, so... Hellcat goes to chop down the rose, and she cannot bring herself to do it. Yeah. There you go. That's and all you need to know. Valkyrie, uh, you know, comforts her. Uh, the voice from the sword comforts her. Uh, and then Patsy speaks to them. Uh, Damon, Hulk, they are... Li- well, di- I'm, and I'm doing this, by the way, so you won't. Uh, listen to me. <laughs> what we're doing is wrong. And she explains, you know, why it's wrong. Destroying the one chance for a life and, you know... And this is basically back... We, since we're talking about Star Trek all uh, again, you know. Anyway... In this case, the needs of the many out, outweigh the needs of the one. Right. Um, so then the, the, they're talking to the aliens. Uh, but a new voice chimes in, Brian. It's the, the Rose of Purity. That's right. I cannot forsake you, my children, though your violence did me grave psychic damage. Uh, I see now that what has ha- what transpired here this day has begun to, uh, has been an import to us all. For what man, woman, or God can truly appreciate any paradise until he has first walked through the wasteland of his own heart? And then as Hulk says, flower makes everything nice again. (laughs) Paradise returns. But when paradise returns, so does the Enchantress. Yes. She is having none of this. Yeah. Um, She she tells him, you know, you've done it. You've screwed Valkyrie. um, And I'm going to leave you here. To rot for all eternity. But. Not only that. She's she's planning. Even though the physical manifestation of love itself. Is standing nearby. In her rage. She is going to destroy the body of Brunhilde the Valkyrie. Uh, she goes to do that. But our other defenders. Have used this time wisely. To track down where she is holding the Valkyrie's body. Uh, and. There's about to be. A big battle. The boss battle is going to happen. But what happens, Brian? Uh, before the big boss battle can happen, Love confronts Enchantress and says uh, that it was Love himself or itself, itself, he herself, who reached out to Doctor Strange's mind and led Doctor Strange, Spider Man, the Beast, and Gargoyle here. Um, because he has learned that. The Enchantress, she does not love love. She seeks to possess love. And such greed is the antithesis of all that love is. Um, So he he has betrayed her. And uh, what he does, what love does, is he pulls Barbara Norris's soul out of Valkyrie's imprisoned body and takes her off together. So we get, you know... uh, we get to have the ending been, for Barbara Norris. Yeah, people who have been with us since episode one. Uh, you know, you, you lost Kyle Richman, a.k.a. Nighthawk. Now truly say goodbye to Barbara Norris. Not Valkyrie, but the part of part of the Valkyrie that you've known since, you know, this podcast started is truly gone. This is the, the end of the story for Barbara Norris. And sadly, that means no need for Jack Norris to return uh, I know that that Brian is weeping at the moment. Um, Jack Norris did return, <laughs> but but with no need to return. But anyway, <laughs> he did return though, but not in the pages of the Defenders. <laughs> All right, I'm still waiting for you to pitch your Jack Norris uh, Agent of Shield comic book. 
But anyway. Well, well, you know, you're the one back to work. Well, I, we can't talk about that on the air, can we? <laughs> nope. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, ye devils in mortal form, thou shalt not leave this castle alive. Enchantress is pissed off now. She's ready to take out these four defenders who've shown up and ruined everything. But guess what? A fifth defender is now among them, Brian. That's right. Uh, the Valkyrie is dead. Long live the Valkyrie. Uh, Valkyrie, in my favorite of her, her costumes, uh, she says, Indeed, Doctor Strange, after more years than can, be, than can be counted, Brunhilde hath returned to her rightful body. Uh, for when love drew Barbara Norris's spirit forth, my own disembodied soul was drawn here to its rightful place. And now, Enchantress, the hour of reckoning has come at last. Face go. the vengeance of the Valkyrie. <laughs> All right. So uh, then we get in 109, <clears throat> we have uh, Grunwald and Dematis as co-scriptors. Don Perlin again on breakdowns, but just Joe Sinnott on finishes, uh, which makes it actually a, an overall much better looking issue. Right. Um, I'm not there yet. I'm going to let you describe it because I'm still putting issue 108 back in my bag. <laughs> taping bag shut and unfortunately i don't have 109 as a single so i'm switching over to the black and white marvel essential reprint oh that's very sad it is very sad. sad it's a it's a it's an interesting cover it's a damn busy cover um uh that that has the beast dr strange spider-man gargoyle valkyrie and the enchantress uh the splash page has the same characters lined up um and basically it just gets us back where we left off um, we get an explanation from the Enchantress, uh, you know, explaining basically what's just happened in the previous issues. Valkyrie tells the Defenders, basically, this bitch is mine. Hang back. Uh, you know, this is this is my fight. Uh, and, and we go from there. Doctor Strange doesn't agree. He does not agree. Um, but he, uh, Valkyrie has him put up a, a containment spell. Around her and the Enchantress. Right. Uh, so that they cannot interfere. And now here's something I want to ask you. Yeah. Okay. Am I forgetting? I mean, we've, we've, we're up to Defenders issue 109. And yeah. we've included, you know, some Marvel team-ups, some Avengers issues, all the crossovers, Captain America. At some point, <coughs> did the rules change where Valkyrie was allowed to fight another woman without causing herself physical pain? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, at some point, apparently, Mark DeMattis changed the rules, okay. because I definitely don't remember any moment where that happens, it, unless, unless, here's my Marvel no prize, Brian. Okay. Because now that Brunhilde has returned to her original body, whatever process the Enchantress used to swap those bodies, which would have put that rule in place is now null and void. There you go. And you know what? You're right. Because as we're as you're talking about and thinking about it, yes, the rule that she couldn't strike another woman was put upon her by the Enchantress. Exactly. Back in those early Defenders issues. So yes, you're right. Okay. There you go. Exactly. You get a no prize. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, I will be expecting my no prize to be winging its way to me any time now. Uh, <laughs> in any case... <laughs> Um, I do find it interesting that while this, uh, what, right before Doctor Strange cast the spell to create this uh, cage match between Valkyrie and Enchantress, uh, Spider-Man and Doctor Strange have an exchange, exchange explaining why she's in a different costume. <laughs> um, Spider-Man says, how come Val's costume is different? Did it come with her real body or what? Even though when we saw her real body, it was in the original costume. And Doctor Strange says, apparently it is the gear in which her rightful form was clad, Spider-Man. Uh, I don't think that was true. I'd have to go back and look at the previous issue. But regardless, um, clearly this is a decision that's been made. Now that the, the guys outside the uh, the cage match are attacked by harpies. Uh, that's created right. by the Enchantress. Um, and you know, it, it's nice to see uh, Spider-Man as a defender alongside the Beast. Because both of them have just got great quips and one-liners as they fight. You know, Spider-Man uh, 
punches a harpy and says, bye bye, birdie. Um, you know, the beast, uh, curiously enough, and, and to, to Mattis's credit, you know, beast is often written as just this, this wise cracking guy, but people forget how, just how fucking smart he is. And in one panel, as he's fighting a harpy, we, we get his treaties, rhetorical treaties on, uh, you know, whether harpies are found in Greek mythology or Norse mythology. Right. And then he says, then again, if these bird ladies were strictly of the mythic persuasion, we wouldn't have to fight them. So, so he is, he, and again, that's, that's Dematis earning his own no prize. Yeah, exactly. You know, like they shouldn't be harpies working for a Norse goddess, but you know, we'll just hand wave that away. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So the fight goes on, uh, between, uh, Brunhilda, the Valkyrie. Well, we're not going to call her that. Between the Valkyrie and the Enchantress. Um, Valkyrie 2.0. Yeah, Valkyrie 2.0. Or Except the, we can't call her that for the rest of the podcast. So we'll just... Everybody remember from this point going forward. Yes. This is the original the Asgardian Valkyrie. Valkyrie. Yeah. Whose name is also Brunhilda, but we won't call her that. Right. Because <laughs> uh, every, time, every time the name Brunhilda appears... I want Bugs Bunny to be singing it. No, actually, sorry, Elmer Fudd to be singing, Oh, Brunhilda, you're so lovely. <laughs> yes, I know it. I can't help it. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. I want to, I got to go, I, I need to go rewatch that right now. Anyway. You're in Magic Helm. <laughs> <laughs> this whole scene is now recast with Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd. But anyway. We uh, we do, and and the defenders along with us. We we quickly discover that this Valkyrie is not like the old Valkyrie. This Valkyrie has no qualms about killing an opponent. Uh, she is legitimately trying to kill the Enchantress. Right. Right. As as she would. Um. Anyway, then we have this moment, which also addresses the presence of the harpies where Spider-Man uh, saves an overwhelmed Doctor Strange and then Gargoyle flies over and he says, Doctor, I know this might sound crazy, but the Harpy's life forces felt peculiar as I, uh, as I sapped them uh, like they didn't belong in those awful bodies. He was sapping some kind of energy out of them. Uh, and Doctor Strange realizes, oh, if this is an enchantment, I can undo it. And sure enough, Brian... They're not harpies at all. This explains the fact that harpies are from Greek mythology because they're actually women who, who the Enchantress has enchanted, uh, transformed into these harpies, and, and then uh, they're now women again, and the fight is over, except the fight between uh, the Enchantress and Valkyrie continues. That, uh, that strange sphere in which the Valkyrie's soul was once contained, the crystal, is lying amidst the debris inside the cage match. There you go. Right. This um, is what we call a MacGuffin, by the way. <laughs> well, sort of, but go ahead. Yeah, so to, to, <clears throat> you know, to, to wrap it up, because I don't know that we need to dwell on it, Valkyrie, uh, you know, she traps Enchantress's spirit inside the same crystal that hers was trapped in. Uh, Enchantress's body falls lifeless to the floor. Uh, Valkyrie is about to smash the crystal, destroy Enchantress forever, but then she decides against it. No, death would be a release from the hell inside this demon globe. So she gives the crystal to Doctor Strange for safekeeping. Um, obviously, Enchantress has showed up in Marvel Comics since then, so we know that Doctor Strange dropped the ball. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, the defenders want to go home, but but Valkyrie says, nope, I've got some shit to take care of. Uh, and she goes to see Odin in actually my favorite scene in this issue. See, my least favorite scene, but not because of Dematis' writing or anything like that. I just, you know, as we've talked on the show before, Thor was the one Marvel comic I just could never get into. Asgard bores me to fucking tears. Uh, you know what? In uh, general, me too. Uh, and I loved Thor always in the Avengers was bored by, I love Norse mythology. I'm a huge Norse. Anyone who's read my stuff over the years knows that I love Norse mythology. Uh, but I, I never liked the mighty Thor comic book growing up. 
although I loved Thor in Avengers. Right. Because the stuff, all the sort of Shakespearean, you know, like the way that they executed it was really dry to me. Right. Right. Um, but I did like this scene because of the sort of father-daughter relationship between Valkyrie and Odin and her basically going to Odin, who knows all and sees all, and says, hey, you had to have been completely aware of the fact that the Enchantress screwed me over for all of these years and you did nothing, you son of a bitch. It's, I like the scene. I like that it humanizes Odin. Um, you know, they, they reconcile. He explains to her what happened. Right. Uh, and, and there is a great panel there at the end where Odin, the All-Father himself, <clears throat> there's a, a tear coming out of his eye. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so he... But what, but what I'm excited about is what happens on the next page. Oh, okay. Uh, because it's the beginning of one of my favorite Defender story arcs. Uh, it's right up there with Six-Fingered Hand... And uh, the Headman Nebulon Elf with a Gun Saga. Uh -oh. uh, it's coming up soon. Not this episode, not next episode. Three episodes from now it's coming up. But uh, we get an interlude somewhere between realities uh, where Hulk, Submariner, and Son of Satan have been separated from the rest of their friends on the way home. And they fall through a hole in space and time. Um on a planet that looks like Earth, maybe it is Earth, and somebody who we don't see, somebody off-panel says, not the most graceful of landing guys, and Hulk says, huh? Hulk is seeing things. And Namor says, by the swirling Sargasso, and Son of Satan says, it cannot be. And, you know, what's, again, what's interesting about this trio is that they're, they're such a stable group. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but but actually, we we do learn who they're talking to uh, very soon. Yeah, very soon. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we go back to the Upper West Side of Manhattan, where uh, Hank McCoy's partner Vera and uh, and and Hellcat's uh, housekeeper Dolly are having a nice cup of tea and some cookies together um, at the in in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And then the Beast, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, Gargoyle, and Hellcat reappear. There you go. And Doctor Strange is disturbed because Hulk, Son of Satan, and Namor did not appear with them. There you go. And he's trying to find them. Yep. He doesn't know what to do. Uh, Spider-Man says, do you mean it's time to go off on another cosmic quest, Doc? This kind of stuff is not up my alley. But since you did save my life a few weeks back, you can count old Spidey in. Uh, Doctor Strange says, no, uh, I, I basically have to mystically scour the dimensional pathways. So. Yep. So Doctor Strange leaves. Uh, Beast one, or Gargoyle once again delivers his, his catchphrase. How does he do that? <laughs> <laughs> As then, catchphrases uh, go, it leaves much to be desired. But I'm glad you get a kick out of it. It, it makes me giggle every issue. Uh, <laughs> then Spider-Man takes his leave of the Defenders, but Gargoyle asks if he, he can tag along with the young man, and Spider-Man says, sure. And uh, that adventure will pick up in Marvel Team-Up issue 119, which Chris and I will be talking about next week. Right. Uh, but it does not end this issue. No. No. So uh, Hank and Vera go out on a date. Uh, you know, Hellcat and Dolly are, are, are alone by themselves. Uh, and basically, the, she's, she's saying, no, I'm fine. Dolly's concerned about her, but she says, no, I'm fine. Uh, but the moment she says, I'm the happy-go-lucky Hellcat, nothing ever gets me down, she breaks down in tears uh, and, and sobs on Dolly's lap. She starts uh, looking through old photo albums, um, and, and we are reminded that as far as she knows... Or her father wasn't human at all, but it, but a devil in mortal form. Uh, and Dolly says the thing that Brian Keene has been saying all along. Now, hold <laughs> on there, young lady. From what you told me, the creature that called itself Satan was as big a liar as you could find anywhere. Why are you just sitting back and taking his word for all this, Brian? Thank you, Dolly. <laughs> 
There you go. Yes, and Patsy decides that, uh, you know, after after the war with the six-fingered hand, she just assumed uh, that it was all true, and she decides maybe it's time she finds out the truth about her father. So after Dolly goes to sleep, we see Patsy packing a suitcase. Uh, she looks at a framed photo of herself, Valkyrie, and Clea, and uh, she says, you know, maybe it's a good thing Val decided to stay in Asgard and that Clea has returned to her home dimension. Uh, a quick aside, in the pages of Doctor Strange, uh, at this moment in time, 1982, Clea and Doctor Strange had some relationship problems, and they broke up. Um, that is why you you suddenly aren't seeing her here in the pages of the Defenders anymore. But, you know, Hellcat thinks, uh, you know, Clea and Valkyrie were two of my closest friends, um, you know, and, and you know, uh, as long as they were around, I always had a handy crutch. And she says, no more crutches. It's time for her to to go off and be her own woman. And so she she walks into the night, but she does pause and think about Kyle Richman, a.k.a. Nighthawk, who is, of course, still very, very dead. <laughs> like General Francisco Franco. And that reference, <laughs> that dates me significantly. Now, right. interestingly enough, Brian, if we ended on that image of Patsy walking away, and I'm glad this wasn't, that this issue would have been almost a good ending for this series. You've wrapped up the team. Oh uh, yeah, if this was sent... the last issue of the Defenders, that that would have done it right there. Yeah, you've you've sent them all off on their own uh, uh, journeys, except we have this the, the sort of lingering things that each character is sort of off doing. Um, but but we were wrong moments ago. Uh, because we do find out uh, what person Hulk and Submariner and, and the Son of Satan had uh, been confronted by in That's this right. strange That's right. other realm. Now, we'll tell you in a second, listeners, but first we're going to give you a multiple choice. Is it A, Jack Norris, B, the elf with a gun, or C, Kyle Richmond, who's dead? Well, let's find out, because we rejoined Doctor Strange traveling between the dimensions. He's feeling all morose that Clea has left him and that Kyle's still dead. And, and uh, then he gets sucked through that same hole in time and space that that Hulk and Namor and Son of Satan did. And uh, I think it's very telling here. He doesn't say omnipotent Ashtor. He doesn't use any of, of those. He says, gods of the multiverse. It can't be. Yep. And who's the figure standing with Son of Satan, Namor, and the Hulk? Well, it's a person who looks suspiciously like Nighthawk, Brian. Who different says, costume. Who says, in, in a different costume, but who says, don't let the new duds fool you. And, you know, interestingly enough, it's the 80s by now, and people are still referring to clothes as duds. But anyway... <laughs> Don't let the new duds fool you. It's your old buddy Nighthawk back from the dead. Now, dun, dun, dun. Uh, that may or may not be true, folks, uh, but we will find out soon enough. That's right. Now, I want to remind you, folks, next week, uh, because we're following this in continuity, uh, next week we take, a, we take a quick side trip from this story. How, how is Nighthawk back from the dead? Is he actually back from the dead? We're going to find out. But it'll be two episodes from now. Next week, we're going to cover Defenders 110, which is the final appearance of Devil Slayer. Uh, 111, which details the start of Patsy's journey to learn the truth about her father. And Marvel Team Up 119, which takes place immediately after this. And, and that details uh, Spider-Man and Gargoyle's big adventure. There you go. And I would watch that movie, Spider-Man and Gargoyle's I, big adventure. I would... I would I don't know why Marvel won't let me write for them anymore, but I, I could I could just I could do a six issue buddy comic, Gargoyle and Spider Man on the Road, and <laughs> with young Peter Parker and and ancient Isaac Christians and Christians, exactly. Uh, you know that'd be great. Now, see, I'd probably use Miles Morales. Uh, oh yeah, Miles Morales under, and so, Isaac know, the, Christians, a World War One era veteran. Uh, you know trapped in this this undying body and this teenage kid trapped on an earth that isn't his can, you know? can morgan freeman be the voice of gargoyle oh my god that's perfect 
Please, Morgan Freeman as the voice of Gargoyle. Thanks, everybody. All right. Well, folks, if you enjoyed this show, we want to remind you, uh, Chris, every week, is on a show called Three Guys with Beards, along with James Moore and Jonathan Mayberry. I am on a show every week with Dave Thomas, Mary San Giovanni, and a rotating cast of co-hosts called The Horror Show with Brian Keene. And our engineer, Tommy Clark, is on a show every week about the intersection between heavy metal music and horror. That's called the Necrocasticon. All three of those podcasts, as well as Defenders Dialogue, are made available to you for free by the Project Entertainment Network. If you'd like to support the network and support our shows, the easiest way to do that is give them $1 a month on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, uh, search for Project Entertainment Network there. You'll find them, and uh, you can get exclusive podcast episodes that, that you won't hear anywhere else. In fact, uh, I'm doing one this week. There'll be one up on there. Um, yeah. But, yeah, all, all of those shows are available on iTunes, Spotify, yep. iHeartRadio, Stitcher, etc. cetera. Uh, so we thank you for supporting yep. the network and for supporting us. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I want to reiterate that, Brian, and just say that uh, if you enjoy this show – a dollar a month to, to the Patreon of, uh, uh, of <clears throat> excuse me, of the network. Um, you know, it's it's only a dollar a month, but it supports not just, I feel like we're doing a telethon now. It's only a dollar a month, but it supports not just this show, but the horror show with Brian Keene and Three Guys with Beards and every other show. Yeah, there's, the there's 25 shows on this network. So one dollar a month, you're supporting all those shows. Four know? cents a show. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I'm, I'm glad you can do the math. I can't. I'm, <laughs> I'm a writer, so I don't know how to do math, which there you go. leads me to wonder how you can do math. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, it, it, did your brain just hurt? <laughs> it did. All right, Brian, enough of the nonsense. Excelsior, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Bye. Do you love comic books and consider yourself a diehard fan? Then you need to listen to Parlapod. We have news, reviews, and interviews with your favorite pros, all while bringing some serious laughs. New episodes drop every Wednesday in time for New Comic Book Day. Parlapod is available on the Project Entertainment Network, all major podcast outlets, and parlapod.com. Tune in and fuel your fandom with Parlapod. My Favorite Story, a podcast author anthology featuring short fiction from the hosts of the Project Entertainment Network shows. Three guys with beards. Jim Moore, Jonathan Maybury, and Chris Golden. Tom Clark from Necrocast, it on. Brian Keene of The Horror Show. Chuck Buda, and Armand Rosamilia of The Mando Method. Mary San Giovanni of Cosmic Shenanigans. Jay Wilbin from Matters of Faith. John Urban Sick of Ink Stains. Biz Ong's Mr. Frank. Available on Kindle and in paperback and through the Project Entertainment Network store. www.projectentertainmentnetwork.com This has been an exclusive presentation of the Project Entertainment Network. 